Right then, starting off the countdown, he's only been at Liverpool since 2022. He is the most expensive player in the history of Liverpool Football Club. And while he hasn't been here that long, he's already made the list. At number 50, it's Captain Chaos. It's Darwin Nunez. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, fine, fine. I mean, is he the 50th best signing of all time? I mean, yeah, clearly, quite clearly. Who am I to question the vote? It's testament to how he's connected with the fans, as a, maybe a, more so than anything he's achieved. I think he's one of them, them people that's easy to get behind as a, as a player. You know, you see him, he's wholehearted. He's he's a bit different, isn't he? You know, he's got a, a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a wild streak in him. And I think Liverpool fans have always liked that in a player. There's a recency bias thing I can understand. I think in the fullness of time, I could quite see him being so much higher on the list than 50th. Um, but I think it's, it is testament to him that despite that and despite some of the struggles the team had and he's had, that Liverpool fans still sing his name every time he warms up, every time he comes on, every time he gives a free kick away or wins a throw in or whatever. Um, he's always got the fans on side. So yeah, he's, he's one of them that I think we might do a show in the future about cult heroes and he might be one of them that features on that as well. So yeah, fine. Fine. He's, he's, he's exciting, he's fun, everybody loves him. The outside world are unconvinced about him, which makes us love him even more. I can live with that one there. At number 49, another player signed in 2022, albeit a January signing. A player Liverpool dived into the market for to stop him going to Spurs. Liverpool pay £50 million to sign him from Porto. It's Lucho. At number 49, it's Luis Diaz. Uh, okay, we're off to a flyer here, aren't we? An absolute flyer. I think he might have been higher had he not that, had that injury um, mid-season last year, which turned out to cost him a lot of time. But he came into a team, you have to remember with Diaz, credit to him, he came into a team that was really sort of as hard to get into as anyone. I think the thing that, you can, that marks Diaz above Nunes quite clearly is the fact that he's been involved in Liverpool winning silverware. So he comes in in the January and it was a very un Liverpool move to make. And how many times have been having good seasons and the, the prevailing logic has been double down in January, go and get that play, go and get the two players or whatever that gives you that what it's needed to get across the line. And we just did it with Diaz. I mean, we nearly did it with Diaz and Carvalho, barring a couple of hours of difference in the, uh, the transfer window closing. But we get Diaz in, and then he just comes in, and, and he's you know he's in a rich favour form for Porto. It only took about thirty minutes of watching him when he came on it for Liverpool, and I thought, oh, that's why Liverpool signed him. I thought that was straight away it just it made made sense. You know, he came on, he, he was running around like a you know like a lunatic, wasn't he? You know, um, Cardiff wasn't it in the cup. I think that would be more. So it, it, it was like, and and you have to trust Liverpool's recruitment with forwards. It's been generally it's been pretty good, hasn't it, over the last ten years or so. So I think it was one of them that. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked him out of uh, you know 100 players and said he's the one who's going to make the difference. But as soon as he turned up, I think it was it was easy to see why Liverpool felt he could. I think he's lacked to date that big moment, that big hero moment where he's the one, um, and you go yeah that was like Mane Bayern Munich Allianz Arena that you can go sadly you know you can think of Porto away games where certain games you know certain players really kind of stood out and what have you. Um, he's, he's he's lacking that yet um, but yeah is he the goal threat that Sadio Mane was possibly not that's an area of improvement for his game certainly but actually he's the he's all the things that we were initially really excited about Sadio with he wants the ball he wants to take men on he wants to fight he wants to scrap he's got that indomitable spirit to win football matches yeah at the moment very cult hero but has the potential to be a real genuine hero at number 48, a man who Liverpool spent £300,000 on to sign from Air United back in 1981. He was at the club for 14 years, winning it all, done everything. Nowadays, he's a miserable pundit on the telly, but he was a great utility player for the Reds. Yes, at number 48, it's Steve Nichol. 48, about right. Big influence on the squad, could play anywhere. The thing with Steve Nichol was is that back in the day when he joined the club, you had 12 players. 
Steve Nichol could play anyway, probably playing goal if you needed him to. Coming in as a right back, taking Phil Neal's space, you think that's where he's going to play, but you have a player who can play anywhere across the back four, that's just a massive help for any manager, any team, and especially to do it in a team that's that good and to be able to play in every position for the side, that's good, that, that shows how great he was. His partnership with John Barnes when he played left back and John Barnes was on the left wing was just sensational. But then later on in his career, he moved in, became a centre-back, um, played all over and he was a really, really talented. Most thing I remember about him, um, we signed Beardsley, they signed Mirandinia, we went to Newcastle, all the story was about those two. Steve Nichols scores a hat-trick, it's all headlines. Um, by all accounts, mate, a man who went to games pre uh, the games the night before, biscuits and crisps galore, didn't train very well, not a consummate pro, we're probably struggling today as well, but what a player, what a player. Equally adept at left or right back, playing centre, playing the middle. Brilliant, brilliant player. I think he's blotted his copybook since he left because he tends to be a bit of a mouth on legs, doesn't he? Um, but um, as, a, you know, as a footballer, he was really, really talented. Probably doesn't get the credit he deserves. I think if you're having a conversation about right backs across Liverpool history, there's two obvious candidates. I think he's somewhere in that conversation. So. 48 is about right. Number 47 signed for £6 million from Barcelona in 2004, a man who made an immediate impact and became a European champion in his first season at the club. He drinks sangria. He came from Barca to bring us joy. At number 47, it's Luis Garcia. Like Luis Garcia, let's make no bones about it. I mean, there's a guy who has got moments you can point to and say, there, he was the man. He was the man who stepped up. I know, I know a lot of people. I have uncles who, who, who you know, are very hard to please as Liverpool fans, who really didn't like Luis Garcia when he played for Liverpool, and almost, <laughs> it was almost like he was, he, he was continuously proving them wrong. You think, got to think about it. 0405 was a really weird domestic campaign for Liverpool. It was, you know, it was two steps forward, three steps back. It was one step forward. Two steps. It, it was just inconsistent. And he was the one who just came in and actually just gave you some little moments to hang your hat on, score a couple of goals, suck the storm, looked cool while he was doing it. He was like, we've signed this tricky footballer from Barcelona. That's what you wanted to see. And he delivered on all of those kind of aspects. He's another one who would fall into sort of fan favourite cult hero. One of the song, obviously, it was a massive, massive one for him. But I think just on account of that Chelsea semi-final goal, I think he, he gets in any list that you want to do. Really, you know, he could he could probably be in top 50 Premier League players just just on account of that top 50 Champions League players. He definitely deserves to be in the list for oh, literally just for Juventus in the Champions League uh, in 2004, 2005. He scored some really nice goals in that season. He's just a really really good all-round footballer. You can tell he's a good footballer because he still comes back and does legends games, and he's still the best player on the pitch when he does. So yeah, I, I love Louis Garcia, I really do. Um, I think there's a little bit of nostalgia there where those of us who lived through his time and had it in our prime, um, probably rate him more highly than people from a generation before or maybe a generation after. At 46, a man Liverpool spent nine million pounds to sign from Feyenoord. He would run through a brick wall. He loved scoring goals against our rivals. He scored against Man United. He scored big goals against Everton too. He was the hero that we all absolutely loved because he would do anything for the shirt. In at number 46, it's Dirk Hout. It was a bit of a mad one with Dirk, wasn't it? Obviously, you know, when he first signed for the club, you know he scored goals in the Dutch league and sort of like everybody else at the time, it's like, yeah, but can he actually do it in the Premier League and stuff? So, um, but the thing with him more than anything, his goal record would tell you he's a striker and he's a flair player and all this type of stuff. But he ended up being probably the hardest working player that we had in that side. He was, he was a brilliant workhorse and he, he ended up playing on the right a lot. He scored goals, yeah, but he never scored in the, in the number of goals people wanted him to. But by the end of his career, everyone loved him because they they saw what he brought to the side, which was energy and, and determination. 
I think Liverpool fans and myself certainly, you gravitate towards those types of players. I'm actually quite surprised he's so low down because so many Liverpool fans loved him for so long and he was at the club for a good while that he ingratiated himself in the history of the club and everyone absolutely loved him. He scored hat-tricks against big sides, of course. Is Luis Suarez hat-trick against Man United when Luis Suarez basically put them all in the net for him and he tapped them in. Um, but yeah, he was... Um, a great servant of the club. And he was just a brilliant player and he was one of those who put the team before himself, uh, a selfless player. And you don't really think of, certainly up until when he signed, of strikers that do that for you. Obviously, since then, we've been blessed to have the likes of Bobby Firmino who will sacrifice himself as a proper number nine for players around him. But Dirk Kite was probably the first one of those players that I remember as a Liverpool fan that was able to just go and do a job for the team and not get the honours and you know the, to the, the media talking about him in the same way that he probably deserved for the skill set that he had because he always put Liverpool Football Club before Dirk Kite. You know, I, I, I don't think you, where you put him is higher up than um, Steve Nichol, for instance. I don't think he was as talented a footballer as Steve Nichol. Uh, but what he meant to the club, you know, at a time, you know, when he didn't have the greatest of players around him. Um, and, you know, we, we weren't winning titles all the time. You know, he, he was the kind of player we needed, a good, you know, solid player who'd get on the pitch every week. He just had to be in the right place and not fuck it up. And credit to Dirk Kout, he was very good at not fucking things up. And that might be my favourite Dirk Kout thing. At 45, a man signed to replace a club legend. Yes, Jersey Dudek had only just become a European champion, but Rafa Benitez is ruthless. And he went to Villarreal with £6 million in 2005, and he came back... With number 45 in this list, it's Pepe Reina. He's probably forgotten a little bit because of Alisson. I think he, he, he probably suffers a little bit in, in that comparison because I think we've all been spoiled in the last few years by, by what Alisson is. Pepe Reina was, record-wise, was fantastic at Liverpool. And up until that sort of last year, when I think he did go off a bit of a cliff form-wise, and it, you know, it, it got to the point where I don't think anyone felt it was the wrong decision to get rid of him. If we'd been doing this list 10 years ago, I think Pepe Reina would be quite near the top um, because there's been a, a, a real dearth of good goalkeepers. You know, you can name them. You can name them on one hand, Liverpool's really good goalkeepers, and that's going all the way back to well before my time, of course. But you've got Tommy Lawrence, you've got Ray Clements, you've got um, Elijah Scott was probably in there as well. Well, well before my time, of course. Uh, Bruce Grobola will be in there. But anyone who lived through Bruce Grobelar might have a little debate over that. And then, really, a lot of guys who were okay but really didn't scale the height until Pepe Reina came along. And up until that point, he was, I think he was the best goalkeeper that I'd really experienced at Liverpool. You knew that he was coming in for Jersey Dudek. But then... Istanbul happens and you feel a bit sly on Jersey, don't you? Because of the heroics that he was able to put in. But ultimately, probably after the first few games, I think everybody, myself included, knew that this was an upgrade on Jersey Dudek. And this was a proper modern goalkeeper, the likes of which we'd not had actually at Liverpool as someone who moved the needle in terms of goalkeepers since Bruce Grobelar. It wasn't until the mid-90s when I was obsessed with it. And by that point, Grobelar had gone, David James was the first choice, and he was starting to have a little bit of a wobble. Best of all was OK, you know, Friedel was OK. Pepe Reina was the first one who came in. You're like, we might have the, we might have one of, if not the best goalie in the league. He was massive, massive for Liverpool. You know, first season, you know, he's largely responsible for winning, along with Steven Gerrard, the, the FA Cup. He was a, he was a really good sign, and it's easy to forget. You know, not many clubs would do this, or not many. I can't think of too many other examples of, of, of a club doing this. But the hero of the, the the Champions League winner 2005 is the first player that Liverpool sort of upgrade upon after it. You know, Jetty do that to Pepe Reina and it proved to be the right decision, even though maybe the trophies didn't come. He was a far superior goalkeeper and his record, you know, in terms of golden gloves and clean sheets and in a defensively minded team under Rafa Benitez, he was a perfect sort of addition to the squad. But between Bruce Grobelar 
leaving Liverpool Football Club and Pepe Reina, that was always a problem position for me. And actually maybe three years of which Pepe Reina was just like maybe one of the best goalkeepers in the world. Um, the way he commanded his area was unlike anything I'd seen up to that point. The way his technique and how he punched the ball was something else. Punched it like someone wanting to punch someone's face in, which is very, very good. Um, hugely charismatic, great on the ball. Like had that level of eccentricity without being, without the level of, erraticness that someone like Grobelar had. And he was a popular character as well, wasn't he? He was always at the centre of celebrations and, um, you know, even more with Spain, wasn't he, when they, when they were to win their, all their trophies. I think he was one of them that, he was both a good player, but he was also a character that was made the dressing room stronger as well. Yeah, and ultimately, you know, won the penalty shootout for the FA Cup in, in 2006 for us. So, yeah, pens are a lottery, he said, and I win. My God, he did. Hey guys, there you have it, numbers 50 to 48 in the countdown of the greatest Liverpool signings of all time. If you want to check out the entire two-part series, it's available right now on Red Men Plus. If you go over there and sign up as a monthly captain, use the promo code CLOP, you'll get the first month completely free. So go and check out the entire top 50 countdown over on RedmenPlus.com. Promo code CLOP, get it free for your first month. See us over there.